Hey everyone, Ben Siegel here, and welcome back to this introduction to India and South Asia. In a very short amount of time, we're going to go through the post-colonial histories of two different nations. We're going to start off with the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, which was born out of the machinations that we've talked about that led up to partition and independence. And then we're going to speak about the internal dynamics in Pakistan that created through immense conflict the People's Republic of Bangladesh. As we try to do all this, let's try to ask, what do we see that's similar in the experiences of post-colonial India with post-colonial Pakistan and Bangladesh, and where are the salient differences? One of the themes that we've talked about over the course of our time together is the distinction or the tension between centralized power and regional autonomy. And I think that's really clear when we start talking about the experiences of Pakistan and then Pakistan and Bangladesh. There's a country born, United Pakistan, in 1947, that has at its heart a pretty unnatural and unsustainable organization. There's an effort to hold that center, and it fails with tragic consequences, and that's something that we've seen played out even after the separation of West Pakistan and East Pakistan into Pakistan and Bangladesh. So, let's start at the beginning. At independence, Pakistan has a pretty small share of what used to be undivided India. Together, it's about the size of Texas plus Arizona, and it's split in two different parts. There's an eastern wing and a western wing. This is pretty unprecedented, actually completely unprecedented, in human history. Pakistan is broadly an agrarian society. It's got poor subsistence farming in 1947, and there's only a little bit of industrial development that's clustered in some areas than in Pakistan, mostly around Karachi and other areas. Pakistan only had around 10% of the undivided subcontinent's industrial base. In West Pakistan, there were a lot of areas producing things like cotton, but they didn't have access to any of their major markets back in India. And in East Pakistan, there were farmers producing jute, a product that was used to ship goods around the world, but there wasn't even a single mill there, since before partition, everything in East Bengal was sent to Calcutta. It was made into hessian and burlap and then exported. Theoretically, Pakistan had been entitled to a little under 20% of the assets or the money of undivided India, but it took a while until December 1947 until there was a first agreement reached between India and Pakistan. That was an agreement that Gandhi helped spur on. It's important to talk about just how disadvantaged Pakistan was by geography. The biggest problem, of course, was that it had two different wings. They were separated by around a thousand miles of Indian territory. Again, this is completely unprecedented. But secondly, Pakistan had northwestern borders that were troubled by unrestful tribal populations and potential unrest from the neighbor Afghanistan. The Muslim League was a party that had midwifed Pakistan's independence, but it basically was in a bad state outside of Bengal. The party didn't have any of the organizational advantages that Congress in India did. Pakistan didn't even have a new capital. It had to improvise a capital in the provincial capital of Karachi. And then again, there was the problem of refugees. And things were particularly bad in East Pakistan. At partition, East Bengal or East Pakistan received only a single member of the former Indian civil service who had worked in the region, and six other people were hastily promoted. Bengalis formed around 50% of the population of undivided Pakistan, in fact, probably a little bit more. But it didn't take long for those in East Pakistan to realize that the two elements that were supposed to keep Pakistan together, their Islamic identity and their fear of India, probably wasn't going to be enough to keep the two sides together. Throughout the brief existence of United Pakistan, the country's leaders had two interlinked nightmares. The first was the idea and the fear of being humiliated by India, either diplomatically or economically. And the second was having control of the state passed democratically or otherwise to East Pakistan or East Bengal. In fact, the first one proved not to be that much of an issue, but the second one would be United Pakistan's undoing. Indo-Pakistan relations started out bad and quickly grew worse. There was, of course, the refugee problem and then the Kashmir crisis. But actually, the biggest divide between India and Pakistan came through an unexpected crisis, the question of water. The British had created an extensive system of canals in Punjab. This had been payback for Punjabi's widespread service in the British military uh, from the late 1800s onwards. 
They had created networks that linked together Punjab's five rivers and connected them with the Indus River itself. And they never thought that they were going to have to untangle this complicated network of canals and riverways. But Pakistan's economic survival depended on the availability of water from those irrigation systems. They had turned the desert of West Punjab into one of the most productive farming regions in all of Asia. But the boundary award between India and Pakistan had placed all the control points of the big canals on the Indian or eastern side of the border. The Indian government, as the crisis deepened, shut off all the water supplies. Lahore didn't have its water supply, and it put the autumn harvest of 1947 into crisis. This was one of the first crises that went up to the new International Court of Justice. This problem of poor relations with India put immense strain on Pakistan's democracy that was already really struggling from birth. Between 1947 and 1958, when a military dictatorship took the reins, Pakistan saw the slow and gradual destruction of its commitment to democracy. Pakistan had so many things going for it. It had innovation, it had uh, social solidarity, its citizens were improvisational, those who were longtime residents had a connection to the land, refugees brought with them new skills and capacities. There was also a committed civil bureaucracy that was eager to put its organizational skills to work. But ultimately, these factors weren't quite enough. Pakistan had many inherent geopolitical and ideological divides, as well as practical challenges, that really vexed the project of creating a robust state. To give a single small example, as late as 1948, Pakistan had to announce that it would still accept Indian banknotes. Coins would be uh, acceptable even longer, even though Pakistani currency was worthless in India. Pakistan was struggling just to provide basic services. Let's go back and think about Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the vision that he had for Pakistan. In 1947, Pakistan set to work, just like India, defining what its government would look like by the establishment of a similar constituent assembly. Pakistan had the shared heritage of the 1935 Government of India Act, but it was made a little bit more complicated by the role of Islam in the state, as well as the two different branches or wings of East and West Pakistan and the different interests that they had. Jinnah had always insisted that Pakistan was going to be a progressive democracy based on shared concepts of brotherhood and equality. He reiterated this commitment to democracy at the Constituent Assembly, and he said that Pakistanis were starting with the fundamental principle that everyone were equal citizens of one state. He said in the course of time in Pakistan, Hindus would cease to be Hindus and Muslims would cease to be Muslims, not in the religious sense, because that's the personal faith of each individual, but in the political sense as citizens of the state. This was an optimistic, secular Islamic vision, but Jinnah didn't really have time to promote it. In September 1948, just a year after Pakistan's creation, he died at the age of 71. And the day after his burial, India chose to invade the Muslim-ruled princely state of Hyderabad. It almost was meant to underscore the fragility of Pakistan and a real sense among Indians and Pakistanis that the experiment of Pakistan might not even last that long. After Jinnah died, there was a new prime minister, Liaquat Ali Khan. He was respected but uncharismatic. He had come from the Muslim League, just like Jinnah. And he was something of a troubling prime minister. He denounced his opponents, and he said that anyone who was an enemy of the Muslim League was an enemy of Pakistan. So he threw lots of barbs at Pakistani politicians of other parties and other political affiliations. He accused many of them of nepotism, bribery, and corruption, and said that they had to be tried by tribunals, not by juries. This was a very early sign of a creeping authoritarian tendency in Pakistani politics. But Liaquat Ali Khan did manage to pass a piece of legislation in the Constituent Assembly that he called the Objectives Resolution. The Objectives Resolution laid down the ideals of democracy, independence of the ju judiciary, freedom, equality, tolerance, Islamic social justice, as well as the rights of Pakistan's minorities to practice their religion and develop their culture. A lot of times it seemed that these are more ideals than things actually practiced in Pakistan, but they were ideals that were nonetheless important to the self-conception of the new state. But Liaquat Ali Khan didn't have long to propagate his vision either words. In 1951, he was assassinated by an Afghan, who probably was a British intelligence agent. 
And this was one of many future times that Western powers were going to intervene powerfully in Pakistani politics. While all of this was taking place, East Pakistan was beginning to feel its first pangs of resentment over a setup that was unfair and was growing even more unfair through a Punjabi-dominated bureaucracy and legislature. In December 1947, just a few months after independence, Pakistan formed an educational conference and they proposed that Urdu be made the national language of Pakistan. Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan said that Pakistan has been created because of the demand of 100 million Muslims in this subcontinent, and the language of 100 million Muslims is Urdu. It's necessary for a nation to have one language, and that language can only be Urdu and no other language. But this was absurd. Urdu was culturally important to many Indian Muslims, but Pakistanis spoke dozens of languages, and only around 3% of the country spoke Urdu as a first language. The biggest language that was actually spoken in Pakistan was Bengali, and was spoken by 56% of all Pakistanis at independence. This tapped into some big, deep cultural tensions among Muslims in South Asia. Muslim politicians in Bengal had dreamed of a land where they wouldn't be subjected to the economic domination of Hindus, and instead they could take the lead for themselves in business and economic matters. But North Indian Muslim politicians considered themselves to be guardians of a Muslim renaissance in India, and the North Indian Urdu-speaking view really dominated state institutions in early Pakistan. But once again, students but here, as in many other moments in South Asian history, students took a decisive role. In 1947, students in East Pakistan began to demonstrate against a new language policy, and they formed something called a Language Action Committee. Students' focus on Bengali wasn't just a question of pride. If you spoke Urdu in Pakistan, you got preference for jobs in the state bureaucracy, you had better economic and employment opportunities. So the new language policy meant that East Pakistani intellectuals, civil servants, politicians, and students were quickly frustrated by what they saw as discrimination on the basis of language. In 1952, students went on strike to protest against the Urdu policy, in spite of a ban on demonstration in Pakistan. Policemen rushed in, students were injured, and five people were killed, including a nine-year-old boy. And these deaths became known as the first martyrs of the student movement in East Pakistan. Two years after, East Pakistan held its first election, and the Muslim League was humiliated. It won only seven seats out of 309 available ones. Instead, the Bengali elections were won by a group called the Avami Muslim League, which soon renamed itself just the Avami League to avoid seeming communal. The Avami League was asked to join the government, and they agreed to do so. One of the youngest members of that cabinet was a 36-year-old organizer named Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and in time he would become the national hero of the new country of Bangladesh. But that cabinet didn't last that long either. In 1958, a coup d'etat brought a new prime minister, Ayub Khan, to power. Ayub Khan's dictatorship would last from 1958 to 1969, and it was filled by paradoxes. Ayub Khan was a career soldier. He came from a Pashtun family. He fought in the Second World War, and he was broadly supportive of the project of a centralized and Punjabi-speaking state. He was made the first commander-in-chief of Pakistan's army in 1951, but he quickly grew disillusioned with politics and the world of politicians, particularly after Liaquat Ali Khan had been assassinated. As Minister of Defense in the 1950s, Khan grew even more and more distrustful of politicians and the new Pakistani quasi-democracy. If there had been any kind of debate or pretense or uncertainty about Pakistan's democratic prospects, all of those quickly faded or they were put to rest under the Ayub Khan dictatorship. Ayub Khan started out big. He ordered the creation of a new capital city called Islamabad, which was meant, just like Chandigarh in India, to represent an ambitious plan of modernization. But even though it looked modern on the outside and the new buildings that were built and the streets that were planned and paved, it really relied upon an authoritarian ethos and governance. In 1959, Ayub Khan wrote and passed something called the Basic Democracies Order. He took cues from colonial precedent and he took a group of village elites, a large number, who were charged with electing the president. 
These were people who theoretically had the power to make their own choice, but broadly were under Ayub Khan's control. Ayub Khan was an ally to Washington, D.C. He was dependent on American aid and advice. He was influenced by the United States economic model. He was a Cold War ally to Washington. He pushed forward a set of big, ambitious policies that were supposed to forward capitalism and free market liberal economics in Pakistan. All of this was meant to help usher in industrialization, just like in India. But it also meant that Pakistan under Ayub Khan really embraced models of growth over equality. And so inequality quickly grew in Pakistan, and so did demands for provincial political autonomy. Ayub Khan had many flaws, but one that was perhaps most egregious was the disdain in which he held Bengalis. He saw Bengalis as effete, as intellectual, as suspicious, as communally minded, and he didn't see what kind of role they should have in Pakistan's government, which was a major problem considering that they made up half of Pakistan's population. By the 1960s, things were looking bad. In the 15, 20 years since independence, the economic situation in East Pakistan had gotten worse and worse. Almost 80% of the labor in East Pakistan worked in agriculture. Less than a single percent was working in heavy industry, transportation, or public utilities. Wealth was really concentrated in the hands of a very small group of elites in Pakistan, and almost all of them lived in the country's western wing. Really, none of the big families that held money and power in Pakistan were Bengalis. But two-thirds of Pakistan's foreign exchange, or the money that it got from overseas, came from East Pakistan in the form of jute exports. But almost all of that money went straight to West Pakistan. And then in 1965, Pakistan started a war with India over Kashmir. In East Pakistan, for the last time, there was a nationalist rush, a belief in a united Pakistan against India. But that wouldn't last very long. And in fact, the war with India underscored in the minds of most Pakistanis that there were basically no armed forces in the eastern wing to defend them. India never invaded East Pakistan, but East Pakistanis realized that they were deeply cut off from the western wing of the country. In 1966, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman of the Awami League summed up all the anger, the insecurity, and the sense of betrayal of East Pakistan, and he presented a list of demands known as the Six Point Program. This was one of the most radical documents to come from East Pakistan in the 20 years since independence. It was much more radical. It said for the first time that a federal structure didn't make sense in Pakistan. It said that Pakistan should be a confederation of two separate and mostly independent units. Only defense or foreign affairs would be the subjects of the old Pakistan government. This, in fact, looked a lot like some of the plans that had come to the pipeline in the late days of the British. Rahman and the Awami League knew that they would be accused of provincialism, of secessionism, or, or anti-Pakistan activity. And so the Six Point Resolution referred to the Lahore Resolution of 1940, which had called for the creation of Pakistan, and the idea that different Muslim states should be grouped together as independent states. These six points spawned a militant movement in East Bengal. It drew upon long-held linguistic nationalism and the economic hardship that every Bengali knew after the war. Workers joined the movement. There were large meetings and students' processions. There were attacks on police stations in East Pakistan, on banks, government buildings, and the offices of government-affiliated newspapers. The government from West Pakistan responded with repression and threats, and this was effective in quelling the unrest. But in the long term, it put the Awami League leaders in jail, and it made them into martyrs. In 1968, Mujibur Rahman and others in the Awami League were accused of a conspiracy, the idea being that they were trying to separate or cleave off East Pakistan, and they said that it was with help from the Indian government. West Pakistani politicians thought that this would discredit Mujibur Rahman. They would cast him as an Indian agent, but instead there were mass protests in the street, and authorities were forced to abandon their charges and to release Mujibur Rahman from prison. In 1969, Ayub Khan was forced to step down, and the commander-in-chief of the Pakistani army, Yahya Khan, took his place. Yahya Khan immediately declared martial law in Pakistan, but then he tried to make peace with Bengali politician by announcing that political activities would be allowed beginning in 1970, and that Pakistan's first general elections for the National Assembly would be held towards the end of the same year. East Pakistani politicians began to campaign wildly. 
The reason being was that East Pakistan had a majority of seats in the National Assembly. So if any party had a landslide victory, it would end up controlling the Assembly. There were a couple of parties campaigning for the East Pakistan vote, but things were disrupted by a massive cyclone and flooding. Half a million people ended up dying in the aftermath, and leftist parties protested Yahya Khan's indifference by boycotting the elections. But the Awami League didn't quit, and won all but two of the East Pakistan seats. And suddenly, they had a majority of seats in the National Assembly. The minority party was the Pakistan's People's Party, and all of its seats came from West Pakistan. This was a divided country, and it was a nightmare for West Pakistanis. The head of the Pakistan's People's Party, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, announced that he would be boycotting the assembly. Protesters in East Pakistan began to assemble in March 1971, and there were clashes that broke out between protesters and the armed forces. Bengal was paralyzed, and Mujibur Rahman was under pressure to declare independence from West Pakistan. But he tried not to do that. He instead modeled himself like an Gandhi, and he tried to launch a nonviolent movement of non-cooperation. Much like Gandhi found, this was an instant success. It paralyzed the Pakistani administration, and it put Mujibur Rahman in de facto control of East Pakistan. Mujibur Rahman said that East Pakistanis were engaged in a struggle for independence, but he continued to seek out a solution within the framework of Pakistan. Imagining we think that he could still be the Prime Minister of a united, total Pakistan. For a moment, it seemed like there might have been a reconciliation. In the middle of March 1971, Yahya Khan flew to Dhaka with Bhutto in what he said was going to be a last-ditch effort to work out a political compromise. But while those parties met, West Pakistani troops were flown in. And on March 25th, while keeping the Awami League busy with negotiations, Yahya Khan enacted a military solution that they had been planning for weeks. Yahya Khan secretly flew back to West Pakistan, having ordered the Pakistani army to attack the autonomy movement. Pakistani soldiers started fanning out, undertaking targeted killings in Dhaka, and those killings spread and ignited what we would later see as the Bangladesh Liberation War. The Liberation War of 1971 was the Bengal Delta's third big tragedy of the 20th century. There had been famine in 1943, then partition, and now armed conflict. It's been hard for us to understand everything that happened, and so historians are using things like news reports, victims' diaries, memoirs, films, commission reports, and they were still putting together the pieces of the puzzle. Yahya Khan left Dhaka with instructions for a full-blown attack on East Pakistan's citizens. He wanted to violently reassert West Pakistan's dominance over the Eastern Wing. He appealed to the idea of national unity, going on the radio to declare that it's the duty of the Pakistan Armed Forces to ensure the integrity, solidarity, and security of Pakistan. But while he was saying this, tanks, APCs, troops were fanning out to crush the Bengali organizations that were going to offer armed resistance. They went first for the police and then for the paramilitaries in East Pakistan. Pakistan's army was brutal. It zeroed in on slums, it lit them on fire with flamethrowers, it gunned down people who tried to escape. And then they went to Taka University. Troops went through campus, they used mortars on dormitories, they killed students and faculty alike. They attacked the memorial to the martyrs of the language movement, and then they went for Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who hadn't gone into hiding like the other members of the Awami League, and they put him under house arrest. People all over Dhaka were picked up from their homes, and the army said, euphemistically, that they were dispatched to Bangladesh, which meant that they were executed on the spot. Hindus, in particular, were, became targets of the West Pakistani army. There were many foreign correspondents in town at the time, but they were all kept confined in a luxury hotel. And while they saw what was going on, they had no way of really telling anyone overseas what was happening. One group, though, did know what was going on, and it's partly because of this that we know what happened in Dhaka today. The U.S. Consul in Dhaka, Archer Blood, was telegramming things back to Washington, D.C., reporting very descriptively on what was occurring and the genocide taking place. But the United States President Richard Nixon and his Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, even after hearing about a genocide, chose to ignore things. They didn't want to disrupt their relationship with Pakistan, which was a very helpful Muslim Cold War ally to have. As all of this was going on and a genocide was taking place, there was also the beginnings of a refugee crisis.
Refugees from East Pakistan were fleeing in, into India, and there was more than a million and a half there by May. By the end of the war, some 10 million refugees had come into India. Eventually, the Pakistani army controlled the Bengal Delta, but there was a more organized resistance plan taking place, with men and also women fighting from the outskirts. On April 17th, the Avami League went on the underground radio station from a mango grove in India and they declared the independence of Bangladesh. When the monsoon came that year, the delta turned into a war zone. Bangladeshi freedom fighters turned to things like ambushes, raids, sabotage. They basically tried to exhaust and terrify Pakistan's troops. All the while, Pakistani troops were running death squads and mass executions in Bangladesh. In an era of mass media, it's not surprising that this conflict became internationalized, just like the famine in Bengal had been 30 years before. Support groups for Bangladesh came together around the world, and the international exposure reached its peak with the concert for Bangladesh, which was a mass benefit held for children in the new country in August 1971, with performances by George Harrison, Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones, and Ravi Shankar. But more immediately important was India's involvement in the conflict. India presented itself as the champion of Bangladesh's right to self-determination. Pakistan was insisting that it was defending the United Islamic homeland, and you can see that this tied directly into the tensions and that had remained unresolved since 1947. But more immediately, these were Cold War politics. The Soviet Union was backing India and the Bangladesh Liberation Movement, while the United States was backing Pakistan. By November, India had loaned an Indian general to lead the freedom fighters, expanding military operations inside East Pakistan or Bangladesh. When Pakistan started carrying out air raids into India, this was the beginning of the third Indo-Pakistani war. In the final days of the war, Pakistanis launched a final and terrifying assault on Bengali intellectuals. There was a pro-Pakistan militia that rounded up professors, doctors, writers, artists, blindfolded them, and killed them. But by December 16th, the Pakistani administration in East Pakistan crumbled, and the army was forced to surrender. The war was over, and it was possible to see a new independent state of Bangladesh. Independent Bangladesh has had an uneven, but broadly upwards and impressive trajectory since independence. In 1972, it seemed like anything was going to be possible. Bangladeshis believed that the new nation should be oriented not quite towards Islam, but towards democracy, socialism, and secularism. Rather than being Bengali Muslims, Bangladeshis believed that they were going to be Muslim Bengalis. There was a strong vision of shared Bengali identity, though this came with problems. Bangladeshis didn't want to be seen as a satellite state of India connected to West Bengal, and it was also difficult for Bangladeshis to see room or make room for minorities in the country, like in the Chittagong Hill Tracks or with tribal people. But all that said, in the years after independence, there was a big pride in the creation of a strong Bangladeshi culture. We saw the quick flourishing of printing presses, a new education system, national fabrics, the revival of crafts. In many places, religious symbols seemed to disappear, and the new official symbols focused around modernist images instead. This optimism was kind of short-lived. In January 1972, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who had been sentenced to death in Pakistan during the war, was released from prison, and he came back to Bangladesh as the national hero. He promulgated and created a parliamentary form of government. But Mujibur Rahman, now known as the father of the nation, disregarded broad appeals to form a national government, and instead he formed a limited Avami League government. He was a populist and he nationalized banks, insurance corporations, shipping companies, the mills that produced textiles, jute, and sugar. These were the signs of a popular politician who was trying to exert control in a very weak state. In 1973, there were elections, but it seems like they probably were rigged. And in 1974, Bangladesh found itself embroiled in an economic crisis, with rice prices in particular rising. By 1974, there was massive starvation, begging, and distress migration. The United States had put an embargo on food aid to Bangladesh because it had been exporting jute to Cuba, which was against the U.S. blacklist. Soon, in Bangladesh, there was a full-on famine. Bangladeshis worked hard to help famine victims, much like in 1943 and 44 they had cooked food and offered relief. 
but the famine took the lives of one and a half million people. The new Bangladeshi government was exposed as inept, indifferent, it seemed heartless. They almost looked like the British government did in 1943. Mujibur Rahman was frustrated. He thought that the country needed a fresh start. And in December 1974, he declared a state of emergency and suspended all fundamental rights. This actually worked to stabilize rice prices and curb inflation, but it stoked resentment in the army and in society more broadly. And just after midnight on August 15, 1975, strike forces arrived at Mujibur Rahman's house. They killed him and executed 40 members of his family. And it's said that one of the sponsors of that coup was probably the American CIA. What happened afterwards was a long dictatorship, led by General Zia Rahman. And it's really hard for us to say why, after such incredible promise, Bangladeshi democracy struggled. It's probably fair to say that the new state, even though it was proud in its national symbols and heritage, was really the Pakistani model by another name. There was a long tradition of acting as strong men in Pakistan, and that tradition seemed to carry over into this new era in Bangladesh. But things really changed in 1990. There was a long campaign of agitation which finally got rid of military rule. And for the last 25 years, Bangladesh has had an exceptionally well-functioning democracy. The heads of its two major parties are both female, and while there have been credible accusations of corruption and authoritarianism, these parties have broadly worked to face many of Bangladesh's economic challenges. Bengal has long been one of the most densely populated places on Earth. Dhaka alone has well over 25 million people, and there's above 150 million people in the country. And Bangladesh, even that name gets associated with dire poverty. That's kind of true in objective terms. Bangladesh is still poor by most international measures. 80% of the population lives on under $2 a day, and a third on less than a dollar. But in terms of improvement, Bangladesh has managed to beat out all of its neighbors in South Asia. In 1971, the average lifespan in the country was 44 years. Today, it's 63. Infant mortality has declined and fertility has been halved. Food production has gone up faster than the broader population growth, and literacy has moved from around a quarter to 40%. And the economy has been doing pretty well. It's gone from about 2% in the 1990s, but then it's hit up 6% or higher in the last couple of years. The Bengali economy has always been connected to world markets, but that's been very true after independence, with the rise of two industries in particular. The first one is kind of hard to believe. In the 1980s, there was a massive and quick international market for bullfrogs. Tens of millions were caught every year in Bangladesh. There was a global French-inspired food fashion for frog legs. This was extremely lucrative, but it came with a problem. As frogs disappeared, insects flourished in Bangladesh, and so did insect-related diseases like malaria. Eventually, the cost of pesticide imports in Bangladesh outstripped the income that the country was receiving from frogs' legs, and by 1989, this export was banned. That was replaced by shrimp farms, which have now become the country's third largest foreign income earner. Shrimp farming provides employment for hundreds of thousands of laborers, but it's a brutal industry. It also destroys trees and displaces other crops, it raises soil salinity, it displaces population, and it's led to violent clashes over land. But in the 1980s, Bangladesh was transformed by a third industry, and that was one that you might already be familiar with. That's the ready-made garments industry. Beginning in the 80s, foreign buyers began to subcontract to Bangladeshi entrepreneurs, to produce shirts, pants, t-shirts, sweaters, jackets, everything for the North American and European markets in particular. This is ironic in a way, because two centuries ago, Bengal was also one of the world's leading producers of textiles for global markets. The industry soon became the country's key export earner. By 1990, garments accounted for at least half of all registered exports, and three quarters by 2006. That number has continued to grow. There have been tremendous economic benefits to this. For low-skilled and uneducated women in particular, that boom of the ready-made garments industry has been emancipatory. It's led to rising household incomes and better futures for children. There's a lot of money coming in, but then the other side of that is that work conditions are often pretty appalling. There's terrible hours, there's big health risks, there's bad security, child labor is widely employed. Many of you will remember the collapse of the Rana factory some years back. 
This is pretty characteristic of an industry that's lucrative but comes with challenges and great dangers. The story in Pakistan from the time of Yahya Khan in the Bangladesh War has been something of an exercise in contrasts. At the end of the 1971 war, the leader of the Pakistan's People's Party, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, became Prime Minister. This was sort of a triumph. Bhutto was popular, and this was a belated success for democracy in Pakistan. Bhutto emerged as a reasonably competent Prime Minister. He was able to recover some prisoners of war from India, he recovered some territory, he built new relationships with the Soviet Union and China, he oversaw the writing of a new constitution, he worked to develop an atomic bomb program and he nationalized a number of industries, but he wasn't able to build resilient institutions in Pakistan. He promised big reform of the military and civil bureaucracy, but he didn't deliver and he couldn't curb inequality either. He also showed a pretty strong authoritarian streak against people who opposed him. It seemed like Bhutto had learned nothing from Bangladesh. He ordered a military crackdown against tribal uprisings in Baluchistan, and he gave the army the ability to build up their power once again. In 1977, Bhutto called for elections in the face of mounting resentment against arbitrary rule. And it seemed like the elections were rigged once again. You might even be able to guess what happened next. General Zia al Huk, the Pakistani army's commander-in-chief, stage a coup that ousted Bhutto from power. Huck, more than anyone else, was responsible for making the Pakistan that we might recognize today. He drove the country back into a clear authoritarian pattern. He promised to hold elections within 90 days of the coup, and then he broke that promise, and he'd make it and break it time and again. He sought to gain a lot of political capital by railing against the moral turpitude and corruption of Bhutto. He had Bhutto executed on trumped-up charges. But he found that that language of morality had its limits, and so Huck began to appropriate the platform of Pakistan's religious parties. In 1979, Huck made a move to establish an Islamic social order, characterized by virtue and piety, and women were put at the heart of that program. He passed a series of what he called Islamic ordinances, called the Hudud Ordinances, and they were deeply discriminatory against women. They blurred the line between adultery and rape, there were strong and forceful responses from women's groups in Pakistan. But they all failed to deter Hook, who was anxious to make women the focal point of this Islamization project. But it wasn't this religious revival or religious credentials that helped Zia consolidate his power. Instead, it was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979. When the Soviets invaded, that gave Hook the pretext he needed to give support to Pakistan's military and to curry favor with them, and he drew the military and wealthy Pakistani families into the fold of governance. In 1988, Zia died in an airplane crash. It's most likely that he was murdered by the Soviet Union, but he had fundamentally transformed Pakistan's political landscape. What we've seen in Pakistan over the last three and a half decades has been something of a repeat of what we saw during the Hook administration. There was the passage of an Eighth Amendment in Pakistan in 1985, and it gave the president the power to dismiss elected prime ministers and parliament, and he didn't even need to consult the Senate or Supreme Court. He would, however, require the consent of the military, and since 1985, the Eighth Amendment has been used multiple times to kick out prime ministers. All of this means that democracy in Pakistan has been something of a farce. The state has actually been able to do better than we might have expected. Pakistan has had to contend with a tremendous number of crises. Its economy has been pretty stagnant. Sindh has grown discontent with Punjabi domination. There's of course been the war on terror and the rise of the Pakistani Taliban. All of this has meant that there's been a real ongoing crisis of the Pakistani state. We don't have time to discuss the rise of Benazir Bhutto, Nawaz Sharif, Pervez Musharraf, and most recently, the former cricket star Imran Khan. But we'll just leave it to say that all of them have had to do very precarious balancing acts, and most of the time, Pakistani rulers have failed. Some of the problems that we see in Pakistan today seem very familiar. They go back to the earliest days of independence. There's a democratic deficit that political scientists have identified in Pakistan. It owes a lot to the structures of rule that were developed under British rule as well as the inability of the pa Pakistani state in its early years to create good bureaucracies and civil services in the wake of partition. There's some great pockets of vibrancy in Pakistan, 
Karachi has dynamism and disorder, big population growth, massive migration. There's a town called Faisalabad, which is the Manchester of Pakistan. It's also been able to industrialize rapidly. Pakistan is linked to the global economy in many different ways. Pakistani expatriates bring a lot of brain capital to and from the country. That's benefited a certain class of the urban population in particular. But development in Pakistan has been very complicated. It's been complicated by economic and bureaucratic deficits, by the Islamization process that Zia al Haq and others have advanced, and a system of patronage and corruption that's made the Pakistani political landscape seem pretty treacherous. A lot of money gets spent on defense and the military, and too much energy has gone to things like Kashmir or the war on terror. And Pakistan has really failed in a lot of ways to reduce inequality and bring women, minorities, and the rural poor into the ruling fold. Pakistan may be able to take on these challenges in the 21st century by making use of its immense human capital. It's been a failed promise so far, but it still remains a live possibility. As we go and talk about economic development, next time we're going to see how economic growth and liberalization have played out in the Indian context, looking at politics and economics back across the border in the Republic of India. That's a big conversation, and I'm looking forward to seeing you then.